Uh, Francis, you're a bit blurry. And we're live. There's a 17 oh, second delay on YouTube. So we should now be live. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to the Online Amateur Radio Communities Events Team First um, event that we've organised. Um, it's an introduction to APRS with Matt. Um, we're just going to do a quick intro and a few ground rules and then, and then we'll hand over. So people are watching on YouTube, you've got YouTube chat, we'll be keeping an eye on it and, and we'll make sure any comments there, we, we reflect back in questions. Equally, if you're in Zoom, put your hand up or, or just bang into chat and, and ask away. These things always work best where they're a bit more interactive. And if you've, if you've come to one of these things before, you'll, you'll know the house style we have around this. Um, so without any further ado, um, we'll hand over to Matt and, and, and he can take it away. Perfect. Yeah. Cheers, Simon. Cheers, all. Um, if I press the right buttons in the right order. Can the host enable me to share my screen, please? Ah, yes, 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 yes. That should be on our list, right? Where are you in my list? There you go. You should be co-host now. Awesome. Okay, okay. Looks like you guys can see the, the first slide. Yeah. Uh, so thanks all for joining. This is the introduction to the automatic packet reporting system, otherwise known as APRS. It's kind of a high level intro. Um, the more you dig into it, it can get quite complicated. So this is the, the taster lesson, I guess, to get you started. Uh, so some of you have seen this slide before, so apologies in advance, but there are quite a few new new, new faces and call signs. Uh, so welcome if you've not joined before. Uh, I'm Matthew, 20 SIP. Um, I became interested in amateur radio around 2012 after realising how fragile modern communications were. Um, so at the time I was working for a telecommunications company and there was a, a big fibre break and it wasn't catastrophic. Everything generally still worked, but people had problems with phone calls dropping or getting a busy tone or a website would take forever to load or not load at all. So just one afternoon, the internet was just pretty weird for a time. And that got me into to looking for sort of alternatives um took me until 2016 to actually get a license um i am primarily interested in vhf and i quite like being able to point one aerial at another aerial and just work uh, rather than trying to bounce stuff off the ionosphere but i do understand the thrill of the chase that people get from that uh, and then since 2016 i've tinkered with various things so um, digital repeaters, hotspots, FM simplex gateways, um, APRS I gates, and more, more recently packet radio. Um, so I guess I'm more of a sort of builder than a rag chewer, if you like. Um, so yeah, what is the automatic packet reporting system, APRS? So it was invented in the mid 80s by a chap called uh, Bob Brun Inger, uh, WB4 APR. Um, he had been doing some work for the US Navy, I believe, on a similar system, and then decided that it would be awesome if, if that was sort of carried over to uh, amateur radio. I don't think they're in any way related other than the, they're useful for position data. Um, so it was initially conceived for position reporting, but since evolved to support messaging, telemetry, and weather from station reports, and a bunch of other things. Um, in the UK, you can commonly find it on 144.800 megahertz. Uh, there is also an allocation on 70 cents uh, for 432.500 megahertz. You rarely hear anything there. Um, and groups like Raynet have, have been seen using their own frequencies. So it's no hard and fast rule that you have to use 144.800. That's just where the majority of the traffic is. Um, so APRS is actually based on AX25. Um, which some of you may know from, from packet radio, it's kind of a more lightweight adaptation. 
and it's generally sent using 1200 board ASK, uh, which you can send using a standard FM radio. Um, AX25 has got a basic CRC integrity check, but has no forward error correction or other methods to improve reliability. Um, there are a couple of modified versions, FX.25 and improved layer two protocol, um, but adoption is pretty poor. T to make something like that work, everyone has to upgrade all of the all of their nodes and all the stations all at once, which can make it quite quite challenging to sort of upgrade if you like. Um, and then the APRS Internet, Internet Service, uh, also known as APRS-IS, was created in the early 90s as a method of exchanging APRS packets over the internet. Um, so you can, you, you can basically subscribe to a feed of APRS packets and then start to build services like the website APRS.fi to show users on a map. And we'll take a look at APRS.fi in a minute. Um, so first of all, quick glossary. These are this, some of the, the bits and pieces that you might have heard, but might not actually understand fully. Um, so the first one is a digipeter. Uh, it's basically a repeater for APRS uh, with some added intelligence. So rather than just passing it through like a standard FM repeater, it does actually receive the packet, do some modifications, and then forward it. Um, basically just to increase coverage and increase range. Uh, you also get an eye gate, which would gateway receive packets that's received from RF um, through to the internet service. Uh, it can go the other way. So you can get stations that are beaconing traffic that is received from the internet to RF. It's not super common and it can cause problems if it's not properly configured. I think there's been uh, issues with a station in Northern Europe somewhere that's just beaconing like everything non-stop and that's caused some loops and some other problems recently uh, so it's one to look out for and then there's tnc which is a terminal node controller uh, it's similar to a modem it modulates and demodulates the data and as well as activates the ptt um, so tnc is sort of more relevant when computers had limited computing power um, sort of in the 80s um, you'd have a dedicated box to handle the modulation um, but more modern versions exist. A lot of you will have heard of the Nino TNC. That's like a, a modern adaptation. Uh, so what does APRS look like? So these are some, some packets sort of copied and pasted from my um, eye gate. Um, so there's a couple of different packets here in, in sort of different formats. Um, you'll notice this first one is from the station M0 GQS. It's a cool sign on the uh, left-hand side here. Um, it's been digipeated by MB7UJ. We'll go back into that a bit more detail shortly. And then you'll see this kind of string here. And then below it is, is the sort of decoded data. So you'll notice for this one, it's got a position uh, 5126 and then 0057. In this particular packet, you can kind of see that encoded here just about. Um, so APRS uses some encoding and compression just to, to save airtime, essentially. Um, and there's, there's different methods of compression. The, generally, your radio or your eye gate, et cetera, will handle that, so you don't need to worry about it too much. But that's just, you know, if you see this packet with, like, this nonsensical string at the end, it's probably compression. Um, so yeah, that's the sort of thing you'll you'll see if you start decoding APRS on there. Uh, which brings us to APRS symbols. So when you're transmitting APRS, you can associate a symbol with your station. Um, the way it's done is there's, there's two tables of symbols, the primary and the secondary, and then you can also specify an overlay as well. Um, so when you're configuring your radio, it'll usually ask which table, primary, secondary, and then the overlay as well. Um, so you can generally choose what you want. There are some sort of loose standards. So for example, a DigiPeter is generally a green star with a, a D overlay. Uh, likewise, an I gate is generally a black diamond with an I overlay, or you might see an R if it's receive only. 
Um, and then WX stations or weather stations, generally a blue circle with WX overlaid over the top. But again, it varies. You can choose whatever's most suitable. Um, which brings us to SSID. So when you're sending an APRS packet, you generally send it from a call sign. Um, but in the case of you've got a handheld radio and a mobile radio and a station at home, and then maybe you run a DigiPeat on a local hill, uh, if you were to only use the one call sign, it would be a little bit confusing. Um, so SSIDs are introduced, uh, which is a secondary station identifier. So you can differentiate between different stations. Um, so here's the, the full list. You don't need to uh, study them all right now. Um, they were originally tied to the actual symbol. Um, so each SSID would have a fixed symbol. That's, they've since got rid of that like 20 years ago. So now the symbol is separate to the SSID. Um, but even the notes, uh, the sort of specification, if you like, says that um, these aren't rigid. You can choose them as you like, really. Um, but yeah, it's worth knowing. Oh, which brings us to APRS.FI. Um, a lot of people have seen APRS.FI. It's kind of like a common introduction to amateur radio. If you ever go to a shack or to a meeting, someone will usually load this up at some point. So APRS.FI is a popular website that displays APRS packets on a map. Uh, it was created in 2006 by HESU OH7LZB. Um, it continues to be maintained and developed, so some APRS software and stuff has kind of no longer maintained, but APRS Defy is still maintained. I don't really remember a time when it's ever gone down. It's just super stable. Uh, and as well as pro providing a basic sort of mapping service, um, it's also a valuable resource for troubleshooting. You can do things like look at the raw packets. You can see who's around you. Um, you can sort of compare your station to other stations and see who you should be receiving. Um, and then it's also got some useful tools like filters. So you can filter out some of the stations and, and strip it down to, to what you want to see. Um, so there's a couple of good examples here. Yeah, unfortunately, I have to drop out the slides, which is never that pretty. But here we go. Uh, so this is one station, this is MB7UJ, uh, which is sort of near Reading and Bracknell. This is a, a really good digipeter. Um, it's on a great site and most people between sort of Swindon and, and, and London can hear this digipeter. Um, so here it is on the map and then it is actually sending telemetry. Um, so in this case, it is sending the temperature of the roof, uh, which is currently 11 degrees. And then the temperature, the heat sink as well. So that's the heat sink on the radio. So MB7UJ in particular doesn't have any internet connectivity. It lives in like a shed as far as I know. Um, and the keeper doesn't access it very frequently. It's worked, I think, Dennis said 20 years, it just sort of sits there ticking away. Um, so if you're running a repeater or a digipeater and you don't have internet access, um, telemetry is like a useful way of getting information out that you might be interested in monitoring. In theory, with some code, you could also set up alerts and monitoring for this kind of stuff as well. Um, so I think that's a good use case for APRS, even if you're not interested in sending position reports um, it's got good, good other good use cases as well. Uh, so for this one, it's M0 TJX is a weather station um, just north east of Bristol. Um, so this one is a weather station. And this one's super detailed. So you've got everything you'd expect. So you've got temperature, humidity, pressure, uh, so on and so on. Um, so again, if, if you want a weather station in a remote location, um, APRS can be a good way of getting the, the data out if you've not got an internet connection.
And then with APS, you also get um, objects. So as well as transmitting your own position or your own information, you can also transmit it on behalf of someone else. So in this case, MB7UR, uh, which will be a digipeater, is also transmitting the position of a local repeater. Um, so perhaps this repeater doesn't have the aerial or or whatever to do to run its own APRS station. You can send stuff on, on their behalf, which is quite useful. Uh, did anyone have any questions or anything whilst we're here? Uh, not so far on either side. Uh, we've sorted one of the questions, which was about the secondary IDs. Is, is there somewhere to see them? But we've given them a link for that. But uh, oh, other than awesome. that, no questions so far. The one I had was around those Mike-E stations. Are you going to come on to that? Uh, I've not really got a dedicated... Uh, uh, there's a very brief mention. Um, well, maybe so we'll, we'll get, we'll get that far and then we'll pick it up there, yeah. Cool. Um, so this is probably when some, some more sort of detail starts. So um, when you send a packet, it's possible to set a via path, which is the route a packet should take. So in a traditional packet, um, you would probably actually know the path that you'd want to take. So you'd say, I want to go via this hop to a next hop to this mailbox that exists in Nottingham. Um, with APRS, where you're moving around, you don't necessarily know the path that you you want your path to take, and you just want it to to spread out. Um, so if APRS generally use a generic alias, um, paths are a pretty important part of APRS and are frequently misunderstood. Um, so it's good to just get a, like a looser understanding, or at least just stick to a sensible default. Um, so since two thousand and eight, it's been recommended to use the new NN paradigm which was introduced to improve efficiency and reduce congestion. That was actually a thing that was introduced in America um, because they have lots of problems with congestion over there. Um, but it's kind of since been adopted everywhere else as well because it, it just sort of makes sense. So when you send a, a packet or you configure your radio to send a packet, it will generally ask you somewhere to select a path or a via. Um, so to sort of break this down in stages to understand it, a super simplified path would just be Y3-3. Um, and then each time it's digipeated, that suffix number is going to be decremented by one. So it's going to be Y33, Y32, Y31. And then finally, um, it's just going to become Y2. It's going to be marked as used. Um, so how that works in the data is they flip a bit to mark that Digipeter is, is used up, um, but most radios and most software will indicate that with a little asterisk or a star. Um, so in this first example, someone sent an APRS packet and they set their path to wide 3.3. Three. Uh, that means it's going to be digipeated three times. Um, so the, the first time it's digipeated is MB7 UPS. Um, so you'll see that wide 3.3 three has now become wide 3.2. Uh, an MB7 UPS has inserted itself into the path. Uh, then again, for the second UGP, this time it's MB7 UG, um, MB7 UPS, MB7 UG. So you see there it's inserted itself into the path. And then once again, wide 3.2 has become wide 3.1. Um, so it's been decremented by one. And then finally on that third DGP, um, MB7 UK, again, it's going to insert itself into the path. Uh, it's going to decrement one again, which leaves it at zero, so it just removes it altogether. And then it marks it as used. So that means that packet is not going to get digipeated anymore. Um, there's a couple of things worth noting. In theory, digipeaters should insert themselves into the path uh, when a packet is digipeated. Um, there's many implementations and behaviors, um, so that's not always the case. Um, a lot of people with APRS are using sort of old software which hasn't been updated forever and might have bugs or or just doesn't properly handle stuff. Um, so that's one to watch out for. And then in this example, I've used Wide 3.3. Um, that's just a demonstration, really. Um, it's generally discouraged to use anything more than Wide 3.3. 
um, just because it just oversaturates the network, um, which we'll come to shortly. Uh, Matt, there was a question uh, in the chat um, sure. from, from Dan. Um, it says, is it white, 3-3 white, 3-2 white, 3-1 white, 3-0 white, uh, dash two. Yeah, um, that was um, that was me wondering if there was a typo in the slides because I saw it cranking down to wide dash three, wide three, and that made sense. But you said that it was used up when it became wide two, and I didn't see how it would become that. Um, I'm struggling to drive the laptop. So one second, it may well be a typo. This was a um. A recent edition, this slide. So I did this talk last week for like a really small group of people. And this slide caused some, well, yeah, this is the improved slide, um, but there might be some typos. Um, but no, it looks correct. I might it all have made sense. it wrong. Uh, it all made sense until I read that third paragraph from the middle line of it. it says, once it becomes wide two. Yeah, so yeah, that's something I forgot to update. So yeah, it should be Y3. Essentially, okay, once, it's, um, once it's gone to Y3-1 or Y2-1, you won't see Y0. It just becomes Y2 or Y3. Right, I see. Hopefully okay. that makes sense. Yep, that's fine. Thanks. There's another question, because the... And I know this from my own setup as well, like... Um, there's a lot there was information on the web that I found that it should be the default set should be white two dash two. And the question is how does it differ for from wide three dash three? Uh, hopefully this slide will clear that up. Um, okay. if someone's still stuck after we've done this slide, um mm. far away and hopefully we'll we'll clear that up. Um so we come to filling digipeters. Um, so in this following scenario, you'll see we've got a bunch of digipeters um, and then you've got a digipeter on a hill. Um, <clears throat> so if you imagine this is a densely built city, so you need these digipeters to give decent coverage of the whole town. Uh, and then this is my little car driving around. Um, so I send a position report, which picked up by the local digi it then digipeats the packet and then it's received by this fantastic digipeter on top of the hill it's then going to digipeat again and basically everyone in the valley is going to hear that packet um so there's no real need for these two digipeters to then digipeat it again because everyone's already heard it and it's just going to result in congestion and a waste of air time um so this is idea of a, a, a filling digipeter. So if you know your digipeter is not the greatest site in the world, um, it's just a local digipeter for your local area. Um, you can decide basically, okay, I'm going to be a filling digipeter. So you would configure your digipeter to only digipeat wide one one um, packets. So anything that's not already been digipeated. Um, and then if you see in this following example, um, the, the car in this case is sending wide one, one, wide two, one. Um, so this digi here is gonna receive that packet and digipeat it once because it's only gonna digipeat wide one, one. It sees that's available. Um, so it digipeats it and marks it as done. And then MB7UJ on the hill, is going to um, receive that packet, digipeat it again. Um, so it's going to decrement the Y22 to um, Y21. Um, and then these two, because they're only looking for wide one, they're going to see that marks is used up and they're not going to digipeat that packet again. Um, so that's why you would split your path um, nice. into... Well, we've got a question. So someone's returning to the hobby and he's asked, I can almost reach the Bracknell Digipeter from my home. Please, can you ask Matthew what I can send through it? Or is it just for receiving temporarily? Thanks. 
Uh, what could be sent through it? Was that a question? Yeah. So he says, uh, what can I send through it? Or is it just receiving telemetry is what he's basically saying. Uh, if it's a local digipeter, in theory, you can send anything. So generally a position report, um, which would be your location. Uh, lots of radios have built-in GPS uh, receivers. Um, but it's up to you, really. Uh, I've noticed that there isn't actually another couple of typos in this slide, unfortunately. Um, the packet sent should be wide one one, wide two two for this example. Hopefully that clears a few things up. Um, is there any more questions about this? Because I, I understand it's it's hard to get your head around, and it's also hard to explain in a method that's easy to understand. And uh, not at the moment. There's no other questions on either okay. YouTube or Zoom for you. Perfect. Y yes, sir. Yeah, I think I think we can move on. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, so th this next slide is be courteous. Um, so APRS uses a shared channel, and it can only support so much traffic before it comes congested. Um, so you should give a bit of thought when you're sending packets as to how far they're propagated. Um, so the first obvious one is use a sensible interval. Your um, fixed station, your house. It's not going anywhere, um, so it doesn't need to report its position every minute. Um, something like 15 minutes is more suitable, maybe even an hour. Um, that should be enough that local amateurs can hear your packets and it'll, it'll get flagged up on their radio, but you're not sort of clogging up the, uh, the channel with just noise. Um, if you're mobile, some radios have a feature called Smart Beaconing, uh, which will automatically adjust your interval depending on how fast you're moving. So if you're on a motorway and you're covering quite a lot of distance every minute, it makes sense to send a position every minute. If you're walking, you don't need that kind of granularity. Um, so smart beaconing should adjust that for you automatically. Uh, if your radio doesn't support smart beaconing, just keep it sensible. Uh, one minute is the absolute minimum. Three minutes would be more polite. Uh, and then the next one is use a sensible path. Um, so most digipeters now also operate as eye gates. Most have internet. Um, and the ones, the digipeters that don't have the internet are usually on a good site. So when they digipeat it, it's going to be heard by several eye gates. So you don't really need to do three hops just to, to get eye gated. It's just not necessary. Um, and likewise, if you are using three hops. Uh, three digipeters probably get your packet from London to Northampton. Um, does anyone in Northampton care about your position? Are you announcing that you're listening to a repeater, a local repeater that no one in Northampton can actually reach? Um, so yeah, it's just a case of being sensible, really, and sort of uh, using the correct path for your situation. Um, so wide one one would just be a single hop in my experience certainly locally that's generally enough um, to get decent local coverage sort of anywhere that's likely to be able to reach me simplex um, or you could use wide one one wide two one uh, which is two hops and that should be more than enough for most areas I'd imagine Uh, so there's a few options for sending a price fast mobile. Um, some radios have it built in. Unfortunately, none of them are really perfect. Um, there's the HGUV98. Not many will have heard of. Um, it is a dedicated sort of cheapish um, radio. Um, it's essentially a bow thing with APS sort of shoehorned into it. Um, but unfortunately, it, it's a nice idea, um, but it's not very well implemented. They're kind of expensive for what they are as well. They're about £130. Um, so I've got one. It's a nice toy, but I probably wouldn't recommend you all go out and buy one. 
Um, some of the Anytone DOR radios have APRS built in. So the 878s will transmit only, so they can transmit a basic position report. They've got GPS built in. Um, there is also the more recent 8782 Plus, uh, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, that can receive um, APRS. It can do messaging and some other stuff built in. I asked around and got told that the, the RX for decoding for the APRS isn't great. Um, it's like it's probably... deaf, so it does decode, but it only seems to decode really loud signals. It's really strange. So when it yeah. works, it's great, but it just doesn't. It mar it marginal on receive. It's really it's. Uh, it feels like it's a firmware problem. I'm hoping they'll yeah. fix it. So again, if you've already got one of those, great. That can get you started with APRS, but don't go rushing out to buy one purely for its APRS support. Um, Yezu, a lot of their radios support APRS. Um, I find it frustrating that they don't expose the, the inbuilt TNC externally. So you've got no way of connecting it to an app on your phone or a computer and sort of viewing that data on a, on a bigger screen. Another thing to watch out for is some of their radios only have a single transceiver. So generally the cheaper mobile radios, some of them have just one transceiver. So you can do APRS. But it's, you can't do it at the same time as monitoring two meters or operating on a repeater. So that's just one thing to be careful for. So on this note, so that you will find the radios for APRS like 878 that kind of do it in the background and you can still monitor your two channels. But you will find other radios like uh, FTM uh, 300 from Yesu, which... If you want to send and receive the APRS, you have to dedicate your second receiver to actually do it. And then you are left with one receiver transmitter on the on the other side. So when you're going and buying a radio for APRS, just to find out, you know, whether, you know, what's the deal? Are you going to be able to be on two meters and APRS or not? Or it's either or. Yeah, and then that brings us to Kenwood. So Kenwood are certainly the best of the bad bunch. Um, they've got good APRS support. Um, they expose the TNC. Some of the older ones, it's over a sort of serial cable. Uh, the newer ones are Bluetooth. Um, but the price tags match. So the, the, the latest one, which is actually discontinued now, and I don't think they've bought out a replacement, is the Kenwood THD74. Very nice radio, colour screen, um, it's very posh, has lots of features. I think they cost about £500 new and they seem to have gone up now they're discontinued. They've actually gone up in price for, for whatever reason. Um, so the other option is you get an off-the-shelf terminal node controller. So this is, in the case of a mobile, it's generally a small box that's, that's probably got a GPS receiver and a battery built in. And then it's going to connect to your radio with a, a cable. Um, popular options are the, um, the Mob Link D, um, they're from America. And then there is also the PLX Tracker as well, um, which is from Poland, I believe. Again, small box and battery that you plug into your radio and kind of adds APRS to a, a radio that otherwise wouldn't support it. Um, there's also another a number of smartphone apps. So traditionally, you would be able to, to plug your phone into your radio with an adapter cable and then use something like APRS Droid to, to send and receive APRS. That's actually started to become a bit more challenging now they've all started to remove their um, headphone ports. Um, so you might need some additional adapters and stuff, um, which is a bit of a pain. Um, with APRS Droid, you can have, and presumably some of the other apps, you might have some look decoding packets. If, if they're a particularly strong packet, you can just hold your phone up to the radio and decode some stuff, um, which might be a, an interesting way of seeing what's around. So you, you will struggle. It's, it's not really reliable, but just as a curiosity, it can work. Has anyone, if I missed any radios out, has anyone found the greatest APRS radio out there yet? 
I, I would argue with the Kenwood, the D74 is on Obtainian. If you can get a D72, not only is it full duplex, so you can work satellites on it, it's got a good APRS implementation and it has a USB TNC. So not quite Bluetooth, but you can plug it in. But they are incredibly hard to find. It took me a year of searching YouTube, um, eBay to get one. But the Kenwoods are far and away the best ones I've come across because ICOM don't do anything at all in, in APRS. Yeah. Yeah, those, um, the THD 70, is it a 72? They come yeah, up the again. They use the full they, duplex they, with APRS, yeah. They go immediately. Someone, I think it was Lamb Communications, advertised one on Twitter. And by the time I'd sort of read the tweet and linked the button, it had sold out. Yeah, I, I ended up having a having a search and basically having to click as soon as the search appeared to, to win one. It was ridiculous. It took me a year. Yeah. Um, we have a great radio. Sucked. For APRS, just fantastic. The TNC works and the, the full duplex is fantastic. Uh, we have a question from the uh, YouTube and it says, would there be any recommended off the shelf APRS receivers for personal use in an area that doesn't have any access to any eye gates or digipeters? I think that's on the next slide. Uh, okay. Although it's complicated. No problem. We'll, we'll wait to the next slide then and hopefully it'll answer his question. Yeah, so I'll um I'll keep that question in mind and sort of flesh this out a little bit more. No problem. Um, but it is relatively cheap and easy to um, run either an eye gate or a digipeter, um, and you can actually do it when your radio is otherwise idle. Um, so like a lot of people will leave like their HF rig doing spots for FT8. Um, likewise, leaving the radio eye gating in the background um, for APRS is is an option. Um, it's going to contribute to the sort of general network, um, but it's also going to give you an idea of your station's coverage. And you'll occasionally spot weird propagation events. Um, so my fairly modest setup here, I've, I've picked up packets from um, France. Um, you might see stuff from Belgium, sort of Republic of Ireland. Um, so DX, if you like. Um, so it can just be interesting to just, just spot unusual stuff going on. Uh, there's a few different methods. So you can actually use an RTL-SDR. Um, for those that you don't know, RTL-SDR is a sort of cheap £35 USB dongle. Uh, it was originally created for receiving Freeview television, uh, but some people actually sort of dug down and hacked into it and discovered it is actually just sort of a pretty generic wideband receiver. Um, they are, don't perform that well on APRS for whatever reason. Um, so I wouldn't buy one with the sole purpose of using it for an eye gate, um, but they're an invaluable tool for just keeping in the drawer. You can use them for a bunch of stuff. And even if you buy one for APRS and experiment, you'll find another use for it. Um, you can also use a TNC, uh, which is the sort of physical hardware we spoke about. Uh, or you can use what's called a sound modem. Um, so that's something that runs in software and does the encoding and decoding, and then basically interfaces with a normal sound card. Um, so really my preferred reference is, um, is this software package called Darwolf on a Raspberry Pi with a sound interface. Um, a lot of people already have a, a Raspberry Pi or some, uh, um, and anyone who's doing digital modes already will hopefully have a sound interface of some kind. Um, I did actually look for a off the shelf sound interface to recommend, but I couldn't really find one. There's some are discontinued, some are overpriced. Um, if anyone's got any recommendations, now would be a good time to um, announce them, I guess. Uh, so whilst anyone's thinking about it, so I personally use what's called a CM108. So they're a, um, a, a cheap sound card. You can get them from sort of two pounds from eBay uh, and they can actually be modified with a uh, push to talk. Uh, the modification's a bit fiddly, um, but there's a bunch of YouTube videos uh, and blog posts. It's, it's a pretty common modification. And 
they actually so the by default they have like volume up and down and mute buttons and it interface it basically abuses those buttons to trigger the PTT. Um, so that's my favorite cheap and cheap and cheerful method of doing it. Um, we have a comment from Zoom from Hibby. Uh, we also ship a sound modem as a sound package alongside standard Linux pack stack in Debian slash Raspbian slash etc. Which sound modem is that? It's literally just called sound modem and it was written for the Linux kernel about 20 years ago and still runs away nicely. Okay, awesome. And so yeah, there's Ian, plenty of options out there. And Ian says thank you. That answers his previous question from the YouTube side as well. Awesome. Um, so yeah, as well as um, as Direwolf, there's a few different options. So Direwolf will actually run on Windows. Um, there's also some software called UZ Seven HO Sound Modem that supports a bunch of different modes. I think originally that was more aimed at the sort of HF packet stuff, but it will also do 1200 board FSK for APRS. Um, or if you've got TNC. So some radios have a TNC built in. Um, if you want to interface with something that you've already got, there's a few options again. There's APRX, uh, Zasta, which I never know how to pronounce, or Yak, which is yet another APRS client. They're all on uh, Linux. Uh, and then Yak again will work on Windows. Um, or there's a couple of others, UIView, Pinpoint. Unfortunately, a lot of the Windows ones don't seem particularly well maintained. I think Pinpoint is fairly up to date. Um, but yeah, it can be a little bit frustrating there. Uh, which brings us on to Direwolf. Um, so I think for most people, Direwolf is probably going to be the way that they're going to go about setting up their first Stargate or DigiBeta just because it, you can generally do stuff that you've already got. We mentioned the um, SDR or just interfacing it with your existing two meter radio with a sound interface that you use for FT8. Um, so Direwolf is a modern sound modem. Um, um, it does all the modulation, demodulation and software. It works with real radio plus sound interface or SDR. Um, it actually makes several attempts to decode a packet. Um, so it uses different settings and filters, um, allowing it to decode packets that older hardwares couldn't. So it actually makes, I think it's nine attempts. Um, and sometimes you'll see on packets, it, on eight attempts it fails, but on that one, the ninth attempt, it'll manage to decode it, uh, which, is, which is pretty useful. Um, it's generally known to perform better than old, physical TNCs. Um, and then it can also attempt to fix bad packets. So if if one bit in the APRS packet is wrong, it will almost try and brute force it into what it believes is the right thing. And that's a setting that can be turned on or off. Um, it supports common modes. Um, so common board rate, so 300 board, you're more likely to find that on um, HF rather than APRS. Uh, and then it will go all the way to 9,600. Um, it also includes the experimental modes that we mentioned at the start, such as uh, FX25 and improved layer 2 protocol. And it can also be used for connecting mode packet radio, which is the more traditional proper packet radio as opposed to um, APRS. Um, so installation is super simple um, on Debian Linux. It's literally just a case of app get install Direwolf. Um, previously, I would have recommended building it from source because it gets you the latest bells and whistles. Uh, in practice, Direwolf has not changed much recently. Um, so the version available in the latest Debian repo gets you pretty much everything. Um, and then the um, config file is in etc Direwolf. Uh, likewise, it will run on Windows. Um, you can just download the uh, zip file from the GitHub, um, dump it in your program files, and then you'll find the uh, 
config file in the same directory as the exe. This is really just a quick intro on how easy it's meant to be. It's not meant to be a sort of tutorial on um, fully configuring and running Direwolf because we'll be here all day. Um, but it, it does come with like an incredible user guide. It's like hundreds of pages. It's, it's some of the most detailed software, uh, detailed documentation I've seen for amateur radio software ever. It's definitely worth checking out. Also, there um, we hold um, some wiki pages in ORC to that explain. Um, I think the entire setup from bare Raspberry Pi to to having an eye gate up and running and stuff like that. So, if you have questions, if you want to set up an eye gate um, <clears throat> or a DGP, or just um, shout in the uh, one of the network channels, and then we can guide you to some. Uh, written material that we have somewhere on the wiki or otherwise. Yeah, that's a good shout. Likewise, if there's, there's something that's not in the wiki that you've done, uh, feel free to, to stick it in there because it's all useful information. Um, so this is your sort of basic direwolf.conf file. Um, so this is for a sort of basic receive-only eye gate. Uh, you'll see at the top it's got my call sign. Um, a device is your audio device. Um, it will diff the sort of syntax of that differs between Windows and Linux, but it's basically just the names and the sound interfaces. Uh, channel zero, in theory, Direwolf can support multiple channels on the same sound card. In practice, it's unlikely you'd use that for APRS. Uh, the next section is the APRS IS configuration. So this is the gateway that you're going to forward receive packets. Um, you have to log in. So it's generally with a call sign and what they call a passcode. Um, instructions for obtaining a passcode vary. Some will tell you to email someone or contact the author of the software. Uh, realistically, in practice, you can just Google it. And I think the first link is like an online passcode, online passcode generator. Um, so you just stick your course on and it just gives you the password. Uh, it's uh, not, it's... We have a Sorry, question, Matthew, before we go to this. Um, sure. One person has said, is it difficult to obtain an NOV for an eye gate? Hmm. I've got a whole slide dedicated to the um, fun licensing aspects. Right, that's the no problem then. Is, the short answer is yes. Um, uh, and then at the bottom we've got uh, what's called a P beacon so this is a position beacon um, it's got a symbol on a house and then the latitude and longitude and in this particular example you'll see it's got sent to IG so that's sent to internet gateway so it's not going to send it to your radio it's purely going to send it to APRS to IS making this a receiver only I gate with no RF Anecdotally, when you set your lat long, you're guaranteed to be in Kazakhstan the first few times. Yeah. Yeah, there is a bit of trial and error there. And some software use like different formats and they want like Northlings and Westerlings or something. And yeah, it's a nightmare. Um, so this is kind of some hints and pro tips about Direwolf. So when you run Direwolf, it's going to open up a terminal and um, show you a bunch of output of hopefully the stations that you're receiving. Um, and as well as the packets that you're receiving, it's also going to give you some useful tips. Um, so the first one is getting the volume right. Um, so if your volume is too loud, that's the volume of the, the audio that's leaving your radio and going into your sound interface. If it's too loud, it's going to tell you. Um, so in this example, the volume is 168. It really wants the, the average volume to be close to 50. Um, now, reducing it might be a case of physically adjusting a potentiometer on a sound interface or also you can have some control over the audio levels in something like Alsa Mixer in Linux. Um, slightly too loud is probably better than too quiet. Um, in my experience, Direwolf copes amazingly well with, you know, packets that are too loud, too quiet. Um, so I wouldn't lose 
too much sleep over it. Um, I, I think you, you're very unlikely to reach sort of utopia where every packet is exactly 50. Um, but as long as they're close enough, you should be okay. Um, and then uh, something that I only learned recently that in the within the brackets is the individual um, volumes for what's called the mark in the space tone. Um, so with AFSK, there's basically two tones. In theory, they should almost be equal. In practice, they might not be. Could be for a number of reasons. Could be the sort of frequency responses in the various part of the audio chain. Uh, you also get pre-emphasis and de-emphasis on FM radios. Um, so again, in theory, they should be almost equal uh, and you should try and adjust your station to see what transmissions are equal. Um, in practice, again, dialogue can generally cope with it, so wouldn't uh, worry too much about that. Uh, and then we get to the uh, the symbols at the end. So again, this isn't super intuitive, and you'll only sort of find it if you read through the entire um, user guide. Um, so in the terminal, you'll see you've received this packet, and then on the top right, you'll see a number of underscores, a number of uh, colons, and then uh, the pipe. Um, so a pipe means that if a packet was decoded, there were no errors. Uh, the colon means a frame was received uh, and there was a single bit error, uh, which may have been repaired. Uh, a, a dot on its own means there are multiple errors. Uh, and then an underscore is nothing was received on that decoder. So my um, signal from MB7UJ isn't great. Um, I usually decode the packet, um, but it usually looks something like this where only one of the decoders has successfully decoded the packet. Uh, and in the case that it's repaired a packet, um, you'll see this single um, in the brackets here. Um, so that could be one of a few things. It could be non, single, double, triple, um, or two separate non-adjacent bits. So the default configuration for Direwolf will try and fix a single bit. You can increase that um, at the risk of receiving corrupt packets. Um, so it's, you've got to sort of strike the balance of making sure that you aren't gating nonsense to the internet, I guess. Uh, which brings us to the fun stuff, uh, which is licensing and NOVs. Uh, you will need to hold a valid amateur radio license in order to transmit APRS on amateur bands. It's fairly obvious. Um, should be within the confines of your license, so 50 watts for an intermediate or 400 watts for uh, a full. Uh, your transmissions must be attended, um, although it's permitted there's a specific exception for APRS position beacons that says you can continue to permit a beacon 30 minutes unattended um, unless you're within 50 kilometers of GCH Keeper Scarborough. So what that it's assumed that's meant for is if you're in a car, you've driven somewhere, you've popped in to get a cup of tea, you can continue to leave it beaconing unattended. Um, if you want to DGP, which would be considered relaying third-party traffic, you will need a full full license and a notice of variation. Um, so a notice of variation, for those of you who don't know, is essentially an amendment to your license that allows you to do something you wouldn't normally be able to do. In theory, it could be anything. Um, in practice, they generally follow some guidelines and sort of precedent of stuff that's done before. So voice repeaters, eye gates, so digit repeaters, um, and that kind of thing. Uh, which brings us to a fiercely debated topic, a hot topic, uh, possibly a controversial topic, is um, do you need an NOV for an RX only eye gate? 
this is probably, I should probably also mention these are my thoughts and not the thoughts of the online amateur radio community. Um, so the ETC, who are responsible for issuing these notices of variations, or well, they certainly sit as a sort of middleman between Ofcom um, and us. If you ask them if you need an NOV to um, run an eye gate and gate APRS packets to the internet, they will say, yes, you will need to apply for an NOV. Um, but the ETCC isn't the regulator. And a bunch of people have studied the license, they've studied the Wireless Telegraphy Act, and no one has really come up with this concrete reasoning as to why someone would need a license or notice variation specifically to gate packets that they've received from RF to the internet. If you take, for example, ADSB, which is the beacon sent via aeroplanes, thousands of people are gating that to the internet. No one's got a license. No one's had to ask Ofcom or anything else. And it's, it's kind of the same principle, right? Um, so if you look on APRS.fi or any of the other sort of APRS services, you'll see thousands of stations in the UK uh, eye gating without an NOV. Um, so presumably they have studied their license and have a different interpretation of the ETCC. Um, so yeah, opinions on whether you need to uh, an NOV for an eye gate are kind of fiercely debated. Um, the one thing I guess I could add is no one has been prosecuted for eye gating without an NOV yet. Um, but there are some upsides. Um, so anyone can, anyone with an amateur radio license can apply for one. If you're a foundation intermediate, you can all apply. Um, they're often granted fairly quickly. It's almost like a rubber stamp job. You fill in the form and then you get an email back saying, here's your call sign. And you will actually get an MB7R call sign for your R gate, which kind of gives you an air of legitimacy, I guess. Um, so has anyone got any thoughts on this or tell me I'm wrong or uh, or yeah add to the discussion this is this is sort of coming towards the end now um, so we can go a bit off topic and moan about NOVs so there's no um, questions from either Zoom or YouTube however there was a comment to say anybody who is watching who may be abroad please obviously look at your own um, country's licensing and guidelines before you do this they may be different to the UK guidelines in terms of NOVs, et cetera. Also, it's worth mentioning that, um, you know, even if you if you read your license and you come to the conclusion that you don't need a notice of variation, it is still nice to go through this process to actually understand how this process works. You know, when you decide maybe later to have a, you know, DGP or something like this, you know, or some other repeater, you know, to, to actually understand the process of applying for the notice of variation. And the one for the eye gate, I think it's pretty straightforward. So therefore, you know, you're kind of ease yourself into the world of applying for your different notice of variations. And there was a question on YouTube from Ian that says, um, basically, how much detail is generally needed to just apply for an NOV eye gate? Uh, I'm not sure specifically about eye gate. Generally, it's name, address, call sign. Um, they always want your location in like four different exotic formats for reasons I don't know. So it's like uh, national grid reference, maidenhead locator, postcode, and the sort of traditional postal address. Um, always seems like a weird duplicate of the same information. I think maybe they want your latitude and longitude as well. I can't remember. Maybe I'm exaggerating slightly there. But yeah, that seems to be the most complicated part for me is providing the, the location in all the different flavours. Um, for stations that transmit, generally you also need to nominate some uh, shutdown operators. So if you've got a repeater that goes haywire, that needs to be someone that can access the repeater and switch it off. I doubt that would apply for an eye gate. Um, and also more recently, they have been more likely to accept a remote shutdown operator using something like a, a GSM enabled switch or a Wi-Fi smart switch 
or some other alternative to giving someone else the keys to your house. The other comment we've had from Zoom is um, with a TX and I gate, do they normally ask for like antenna height power? Do they also ask for the new ERP calculator um, that obviously RSGB brought out last year? Uh, yeah, so specifically for a DigiPeter, where you're repeating what would be classed as third party traffic, um, you would need an NOV and they would ask details on the radio, the antenna, because they want to know the gain. They want to know exactly how much coax you're using. Uh, and it all boils down to they want to limit your ERP, essentially, your effective radiated power. Um, so generally for sort of packet stations, you're limited to a handful of watts, maybe three. Um, even voice repeaters, you're sort of limited usually to somewhere in the order of 10, I think. Um, so they will ask a bunch of questions on your station just to make sure that you're limiting your ERP um, and kind of know what you're talking about, I guess, um, just to avoid you overwhelming the local RF environment, I would suppose. Uh, there, there, more there was one sorry there is not more questions but there was one comment to add to that apparently mb7vx was cut to one watt on a recent renewal for uh, some reason yeah so there does seem to be some weird politics that occasionally surrounds these these things um but I don't know. So I can reach repeaters with um, sort of one watt over sort of 30 miles. If you've got like good line of sight, you don't need masses and masses of power. And I think certainly with APRS, you don't really want a digipeter uh, going like hundreds of miles. It, it sort of works better if there's, there's almost like a cellular network. You've got small cells and everything's low powered and everything's... Um, planned out. So I can kind of see some arguments for reducing the power. Perhaps one what is a little bit um, stingy. Um, but you don't know. The, there might be some reason for that. Maybe they're causing interference or something. It's hard to know about the, the full story. Also, there could be a density of um, DigiPeters, you know, in the area. And uh, it's. I think it's assessed on the case-by-case -case basis. Um, so they know yeah, we don't so there have certainly been cases where they've been unnecessarily strict. Um, but as Vic said, sort of case by case. And with the example of me, MB7UJ near me locally, it's got such amazing coverage that you don't we don't really need any more high powered digipeters within 30 miles of, of that site. So you only need some enough power to get it that first hop to um, MB7 UJ, and then it's going to get the coverage that you want anyway. And the only other thing I wanted to say, Vic, about your comments about how it's worthwhile getting an NOV to understand the process and stuff, I would agree. I think, but I think personally, if I was going to run an eye gate permanently, I would apply, uh, receive only I get permanently. I would apply for an NOV, go through the process. You understand the process, you just fill in the forms, and then you get a call sign. The only thing I wouldn't say is uh, I wouldn't want it to put people off just putting up an RTL SDR for like an afternoon and seeing what they receive and, and, and gating that. I wouldn't want it to be like a, a barrier. Um, so I think it depends on the situation. Also, it's worth mentioning that um, you, you you mentioned a time frame. Um, if if you ever look at the discord, my eye gate is strapped to a shelf in the garage uh, by two nails or something like this, um, and I still receive uh, packets from three kilometers um, range with this setup. This setup is literally two meters above the ground in the garage. Um, I'm saying that because uh, sometimes you might want to deploy this and you will have all of this working and there'll be no traffic. But sometimes you need to wait for that traffic to happen because um, it's it's worth having this op um, receiving I get for about a week maybe 
so that people actually drive to work back from work you know there's some weekend activity and stuff like that and then you might see some uh, activity also on the aprs.fi uh, you will get the nice squares to tell you about the coverage of your of your eye gate and where the packets came from roughly and um, and stuff like that so uh yeah that's that's on the kind of uh if i put my eye gate up for an afternoon and nothing happened sometimes it's, uh, it needs a little bit more time i think the other thing I'd plug as well is um, if you're in an area where there's very little activity, uh, look up when ISS passes over because that has an IPRS repeater on it. And when it's turned on, you can have a lot of fun with a Yagi and an HT trying to see if you can get digipeated off the ISS. Um, so I can highly recommend giving that a go. Um, it's pretty achievable, even with, you know, a five watt HT um, and a decent handheld Yagi. Um, and it's a heck of a lot of fun. The one thing you do need to do where you've got the path in as wide um you put i think it's rsiss in but if you look up on the internet it will tell you how to configure your aprs settings to digip off the iss yeah, yeah so there definitely is this this yeah, chicken egg frequency as well there is this chicken egg problem with aprs that i know a lot of people will set up an eye gate for a weekend and receive nothing and then put it back in the drawer and likewise, they'll set up beaconing on their radio. They'll drive around for the weekend and maybe they'll get picked up like twice by an eye gate. So again, they'll just kind of put it back in the drawer and give up. It almost seems kind of regional uh, as to the activity. So if you check out um, Charlotte, who's a member, runs a um, eye gate and the coverage is incredible. It covers like all of Manchester there seems to be like a lot more activity around there. Um, I guess if, if an area is covered by good uh, eye gates and digipeters, it has been for a while, it almost kind of encourages more people to um, to actually beacon their position because it's actually when you see yourself on the map and you know, you know it's working. Whereas somewhere like London, uh, APRS coverage is actually pretty poor. And I think that's probably a combination of sort of building density, um, people living in flats who can't put burials, so they can't run uh, digis or eye gates. Um, so yeah, it, it does de de can be very reasonable, regional specific. Uh, so this is my last slide. These are my rants. Uh, so no, no talk of mine would be complete without some rants. Um, so APRS supporting radios hasn't ever been very exceptional and seems to slowly be falling by the wayside. Uh, in my opinion, it's almost like, I think APRS could be very useful if the radio manufacturers implemented some more features in their radios that made it usable, um, but they seem to be sort of backing away from it slightly. So for the radios we've built in APRS support, um, They'll generally display like a bearing of the distance for receive packet. So it'll say, you know, EI5 IYB is 50 kilometers away on a bearing of 20 degrees. Well, that's useful if I'm flying a helicopter, um, but not very useful if I want to know where they actually are. Um, so modern radios have these high resolution color screens, SD slots, storage is cheap. Um, so why not have map packs where you can see the stuff on a map? They could even sell map packs. I know, I know radio vendors love making money, right? So they could sell you a map pack that you put on your SD card and then dispose it on a proper map. Uh, so that's one thing I'd like to see improve. Um, APRS messaging is a thing. So you can send like short messages to other APRS users. Uh, it's usually super painful um, on a mobile radio. You have to like twist the rotary encoder like over and over again and then click and then over and over again and then click. Um, Yaesu on their most recent handhelds are just getting rid of buttons altogether um, and have moved to kind of a touch screen. But then if you imagine the screen size of a radio with a touch screen keyboard, you're really going to struggle to send the message on that. Um, so that's something I'd like to see improve. Uh, one, one thing someone suggested is if, if, it's, if they expose the TNC via Bluetooth, then you can use an app on your phone. 
um, but not many actually expose the TNC externally. Um, the other one is you can send these objects announcing the presence of repeaters, um, but I originally said no radio. I think limited radios allow you to do anything with that information. So in the ideal world, if I received a packet that said, oh, GB3HR is 10 kilometers away, these are the frequencies, this is the tone, I should be able to press a button to add it to the radio and then start operating, operating that repeater The D72 does do that, the Kenwood. So the Kenwood, yeah. when it gets that packet, it then says, do you want to, and it will then effectively set the radio up to use that repeater, which is fantastic, but I, I've never seen it on anything else. Yeah, so I think it's, it sounds like it's just a Kenwood thing. Yeah, yeah, um, it, but it's such a great feature when you see it. Yeah. Um, I've not seen any radios with like a watch list, so you can set up a notification if you're within X meters of someone um, on the off chance you're at the same radio rally or beer festival. It'd be quite nice if you get a, a ping or something that says, oh, that, you're within... that's better implemented on the digital system. So if you've got the Anytone, it does what it calls DPRS, which is DMR beaconing, and that has an alert capability. So Robin and I have played with this, that when Robin comes online, I get an alert from him that's basically his range and bearing. Again, it's range and bearing, but it tells me when he's online, if you set up that. So it's like a watch this, but they call it alerts, but it doesn't work on the analog side. It's purely a digital DMR feature. Sure. Mm. I already use it to make sure that Simon's far enough away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So I have a question that came to me in the private message on Discord. Um, I'm not sure if we have a chat box on YouTube. I think an anonymous sure. question. Anonymous question. Actually, it's a, it's a mystery question uh, from a mystery person. Um, how comfortable are folks advertising precise home address in packets? Perhaps there is some jitter anonymization involved when it goes to example, the APRSFI. So for my eye gate, you can just pinpoint exactly where I live. But some people would uh, would just put less numbers in their coordinates or they would offset uh, their position 100 meters this way or 100 meters that way. I don't know if you watch your um, experience. Yeah, so if you're using some software um, such as Direwolf and you're manually entering a fixed position, you can make that up. Um, you know, you can add 100 metres in one direction or the other. Um, Direwolf also supports a feature called ambiguity where it will drop some of the digits off the, the longitude and latitude to add more privacy. Um, I think that's kind of a, a personal decision so for me, I live in a big block of flats. If someone wants to come and try and assassinate me based on my APRS position, then good luck to them. They're going to have to run around knocking on a lot of doors before they find me. Um, so I guess that's that's up to you. There are ways and means of of adding some vagueness to your position, or uh, you don't have to announce your position at all. There's also, um, I know some of the radios have ambiguity added uh, as a feature they will they will let you um yeah the, you know, the camwoods do yeah yeah i think yes does that as well you know um, position ambiguity yeah. yeah so it's only a thing that's been thought of by pretty much all the the vendors and mm. software people um it sounds like mm. the mystery uh, person that... taught uh, says thank you okay <laughs> Um, so yeah, that brings us to the end of the slides. Um, if there's any more questions or any more comments or anything anyone would like to add, go for it. Thanks for being a brilliant audience. I will stop sharing now. Maybe. So what I'll do, Ma Matthew, thank you for that. That was that was fantastic. What I'll do is I'll. I'll stop the recording and I'll, I'll end the YouTube stream and then and then people can be a little bit more relaxed if they want to. But just to say we had about 45 viewers overall. So we had in the region of 30 on Zoom and another 15 to 18 on YouTube. So it was really well attended to so everybody who's who's watched, participated. Thank you very much. Um, 
carry on the the the, the chat in discord if you want to and we'll, we'll stay around on here for a little bit longer but um, on behalf of the events team um thank you very much matthew you made it a success um and if anybody wants to get involved and wants to do a talk or or wants to come and help vic and i as the events team just just give us a shout we're always looking for for people with interesting topics to talk about and equally people to help us run these things so thank you very much and i'll i'll stop the stream and the recording and then we can all quietly swear and if anybody's on YouTube, obviously, you're more than welcome to come to the OARC. So if you just go IORC.UK, you're more than welcome to join the Discord. There's plenty of this interesting chats all the time. And there's more of these events that you'll get to find out of before the events, before they go live on YouTube. Brilliant. And with that, I will close it all down. <laughs>